Okay, I think I'll get started. It's right on 1045. So I hope you're all in the right place. This session is for the love of the content editors, and my name is Pamela Barone. Just a quick introduction of myself. Um, I work for a Drupal shop that's based in Sydney, and we're called Previous Next. I've been doing Drupal for about two and a half years, and I, I'm currently working as a client services manager. Um, we do a lot of government media, nonprofit, higher education websites, um, and I am also a former content editor. So um, it's not really a conflict of interest. That's not the specific reason that I'm interested in this topic. Um, but now, having done both, so having been a pro uh, content editor and now as a project manager, I, th I think it gives me some insight into the value that this can provide. So the concept here is that you can build better websites and get better results by paying a little bit of attention to usability issues. Um, so I'll start by explaining why I think this is true, and then I'll go through some specific ways that I found that we can achieve this. Um, and just a quick disclaimer, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about major UX improvements and complex editorial workflows. Um, there's so much complicated stuff you can do in Drupal around usability. But my intention is to uh, get you to start, start really small and start paying attention to little things that you can build into your process without really adding too much to the budget. So um, the idea is to start with a foundation and start with a few um, best practices and, and strategies that get you toward a, a, a baseline of usability that you can then extend with the complicated stuff. But if you're here to learn about complex UX and um, editorial improvements, then you're in the wrong session. So just, just thought I'd let you know. So the idea is, yeah, just uh, get, to get you thinking about these things and, and then working out little ways that you can find on your projects to improve it as well. And I think it's important first to just talk about who content editors are. I think there's often a wall between project teams and editorial teams. So most of our developers absolutely never come in contact with content editors, they don't talk to them, the client lead doesn't talk about them, so nobody really asks, and as a result, we don't know very much about them. And there's no real answer here, who are these people? Um, they range on a very wide spectrum from very non-technical to extremely technical, and oftentimes, these two types of people will be working on the same team. So you, you can't really nail it down, but I think that concept of um, you're catering to a really wide range of people is really important. And the other point to make is that it also ranges in use. So some people are using the system maybe once a month. It's, you know, they have 10 other jobs, and one thing they do is ups update the website once a month. And then you have people that work in it six hours, eight hours a day, nonstop. That is their job, is to work on the website. And another important thing about even those people is um, even the people that work in it all day, some of these people are writing their own content. Some of these people are getting emailed content in 15 different formats from 15 different people. So there's no real uh, cookie cutter model that you can say, yeah, this, this would suit all of them because they, they range so widely. And it doesn't really matter which end of the scale they're on. If you apply some simple principles, you can make their experience a lot better. So, that's who they are, but why are you here? Why are we talking about this? Um, quick cautionary tale. When I worked as a content editor, I think I used probably about five different CMSs in, in about four years. And every time we had a new one, the, you know, our boss would go off and spend a year building it, and I don't know what he was doing over, you know, in all these meetings. And um, someone would come in one day and just say, okay, you're going to be trained now in your CMS. So we would sort of <laughs> hesitantly walk in the room and sit down, and it never failed that within 10 minutes, they'd shown us something that completely undermined our workflow. It, it, it showed us that there, they had absolutely no idea what we were doing on a daily basis, and they hadn't put any consideration into how we were actually going to use it. Um, and really, it was the little things that drove us crazy that, that showed us that they hadn't paid attention. And I always thought because most of these systems were very large, clunky, expensive, proprietary CMSs, that it was a, a case of, well, it's just too hard to change. This is what you get out of the box, and so that's what it is. So it was never really an option to say, well, you know, maybe if you change this a little bit, it would save us a lot of time. And when I started working in Drupal, I couldn't believe that this was still the way it was being done. And it, it was the way it was being done on most of even the projects that I managed. The client lead didn't 
didn't discuss these issues, didn't want to let us talk to the content editors, just didn't really consider it important. And I think the, the advantage that we have using Drupal is that there are so many really small things you can do to make it better for these people. Um, and it's not about saying, well, we just want to improve people's lives. Um, you're, you're creating a tool that enables people to publish information to promote some kind of a business goal. So the ease of use of that system directly correlates to the value for the client. Um, if publishing things is hard or annoying or frustrating, then your tool is less valuable to them because it's going to get done slower and it's going to get done less often. If it's a nice system that they don't hate to use and they can do things quickly and efficiently, it's, it's more likely to successfully promote that goal that they initially came to you for in the first place. So it's, not, it, it's important not to think of it as um, you're doing someone a favor or you know, this is a little nice thing that you can add at the end. It's, it's critical to the delivery of a successful product that the system is usable. So, you know, it, it is nice when you make something that people like to use, but that's not really the point. I mean, just to put it simply, if they hate to use it, then they won't use it. And then they will say bad things about you, which I can assure you we did very, very often and for very extended periods of time. So, I mean, if I feel like that's a pretty kind of obvious point that if it's a nice system, then it's a better product. But most people still don't do it. They don't, they don't focus on this. They don't really care about it. And I, I don't, I mean, I think there are a lot of reasons why. The first one being it's just easier if you don't. So there are a lot of other things to focus on. There are complex backend integrations. There's, you know, is it pixel perfect matching the design? And, and if the client doesn't care, then it's really easy for you not to care. Um, if you wait till the end, so if you say, well, the client didn't ask for it, let's just hand it over and then see what happens, um, that is just not going to work because if the client didn't think it was important then, um, they will be made to know that it was important after. Like I said, we were constantly c complaining and <laughs> cursing these people and saying, you know, why, why didn't they ask us just the simplest question? So at the end, it's too late and not because you can't make changes and um, you know, you've locked yourself in. Obviously, we all know you can still make changes, but the damage is done by that point. So if you've delivered something that very clearly shows no, lack of, no uh, indication that you gave it any uh, attention, then their, their suspicions are validated. So we always approach this very suspiciously. If we weren't consulted, we'd come in saying, it's going to be another one of these ones where nobody asked us, nobody knows what we're doing, and they're going to just sort of um, impose this upon us. Someone, someone once put it as being a victim of a CMS. And I, I, just don't, I just don't think that that should be happening with Drupal. So um, the goal here is to start from the very beginning and build it into the process. If you start at the beginning and if you, if you do it from the beginning, it's not that much work as you go along. So the first tip is don't settle for core. And we all know this on a technical level that core doesn't provide everything you need to make a website. So we always install contrib modules. And um, I mean, it's pretty unusual that you'd be building one without contrib. If you are building a website and you don't want to use contrib, then um, this is the wrong talk. But there are so many contrib modules out there that can improve the editor experience. And oftentimes, this is a simple case of installing it and enabling it, and that's all you have to do. So there are countless contrib modules that you can use to achieve this, but um, I'm going to just show you a few that we use as kind of a base build for our projects <laughs> that just sets you up to be able to improve things. So here's a quick list, and then I'll just run through them one by one. Um, views bulk operations with administration views. This is the core admin content screen. You have two options for filtering, status and type. If you've ever tried to use this system, it's really clunky. You have to apply one, then reset, and then apply another. It's really hard to find things. There's no keyword search. Um, they may not have listed a keyword search for content as a requirement, but if that's the case, it's because they assumed that it would come with it. So simply by installing views bulk operations and administration views, you get this much prettier content screen, which has a title search, better filters that you can apply quickly. And the best part is you can add your own filters. So this is what it comes with out of the box. And this, is, this, this goes a, a much longer way than the initial one. But the best part is you can, so as you're adding content types and as you're adding 
taxonomy uh, vocabularies, you can keep adding filters to enable people to find things very quickly. And you can also add um, columns to the results screen as well, which a lot of people find useful. And this same thing applies to the admin people page. Um, I did a quick uh, survey as I was putting this together, and I asked if anybody realized that the core filter that comes on the people page is filter by permission, which is extremely not helpful. Um, it's literally a select list of every single permission on the website, and sometimes this can be thousands. And you know, the average user isn't going to be able to assess what that even means. So it's not useful. Um, this is much better. You've got out of the box, you've got a username search, an email search, you can filter by role, and again, you can add new filters as you find you need them. The next module is administration menu, which um, adds a fancy little drop down menu. Um, definitely, it's important when you install administration menu, it also comes with something called administration menu toolbar style, and this just makes it look nicer. So if you're going to enable one, enable the other, and then disable the regular core toolbar so they don't conflict with each other. And a, a big point I would make about this is it's not necessarily that, um, you know, going from one click, to, from three clicks to one click. So if you wanted to go to the taxonomy page, you have to click structure, taxonomy, find your vocabulary. This way you can just drop down to one. A lot of people have trouble finding things in Drupal because if you don't use the system every day, you're not sure, do I go to content, do I go to structure? And the drop downs allow you to kind of pre-screen the page before you go there. So it's not necessarily about arriving at the right page in fewer clicks, it's about finding the right page in the, in the first place. Um, a WYSIWYG, I mean, we all know this is in Drupal 8 now, but it's still gonna be an issue for all of us Drupal 7 users. Um, just install one, don't, just don't let your clients see Drupal without a WYSIWYG because they're going to be really confused. Um, you can use CK Editor. That's what we typically use. It doesn't really matter what you use, but make sure you have some basic options enabled. And a really important one is spell check as you type, which doesn't come enabled out of the box. And if you're using the WYSIWYG module, it's not actually an option. So um, if, you, if you find that you aren't able to work it out, a simple Google search will find you this custom module that switches spell check as you type on by default and sets the default language if it doesn't happen to be um, American English. And one of our developers said, but you don't need that because the browser will tell you if something is spelled wrong. And that's actually not true. In the WYSIWYG field, it doesn't. So this is a case of the technical person was trying to say, no, no, they're, they're just being demanding. But the, the reason he didn't know is because he hasn't spent all day working in a node with 15 different WYSIWYG fields. And if it's not on by default, you have to enable it in each field one by one. Um, Linkit is a module that improves the internal linking process. So if you don't have Linkit installed on your site, um, if you go to a, a node and you try to add an embedded link, the process is you have to open a new window, find the page you want to link to, uh, copy either the node ID or the path alias. Most likely it will be the path alias because it's really hard to get people to actually use the node IDs, and this can result in more broken links. And then you have to copy it, bring it back into the other window, and create a regular hyperlink. But the Linkit module with a few really simple um, configuration updates allows you to click the Linkit icon in the WYSIWYG. It pulls up this model which allows you to type the name of any node. It auto-completes with the options. You click on the node title and it creates, as you can see, an actual node path rather than an alias path. The next one is login destination, which is something that we overlooked for a really long time until one of our clients said, why do I always go to, the, to my profile page after I log in? Um, and we thought, well, that's just because it's the way it works. But on almost every site we build, the user profile page is not used for anything at all. So it's a, it's a really big inefficiency that every time they log into the site, they're on a page that they can't use. So the login destination module just lets you pick a better page. Um, you can set up a number of rules depending on the role. Um, and just ask the client. Sometimes they'll want the home page. Sometimes they'll want the workbench page. Sometimes they'll want the admin content page. But it's it's less than five minutes to set this up, and it saves them an extra click every time they log in. And then a kind of a, a minor one that I just like is to pick a different admin theme. I think the seven theme is good, but it has a lot of problems. And the shiny admin theme is a really nice one. It's actually the Commerce Kickstart uh, admin theme. And it also is quite similar to the new Drupal 8 admin theme. And it's just a little bit more professional. It's a little bit nicer. 
Um, it's not, this isn't really critical, but I think it just, um, I think it goes a long way and it's extremely simple, just install and enable. Uh, the next tip is to ask questions. Um, and I, I thought about calling this ask the right questions, but I think the point is that it doesn't really matter what the questions are and how you phrase them. If you get a conversation started, then you're more likely to get valid feedback. Um, the only way you can give people something useful is to find out what they actually need and what they actually want. So ask them how things work. Talk to them about, um, do they currently have a CMS? Probably. What are the biggest pain points in that, in that current process? What are the things they do most often? What do they love about their CMS? And what do they hate about it? Because if there is something that they hate, they'll probably tell you. If there's something that they love, they probably won't, because they take it for granted. So if you deliver them a Drupal CMS and they can't do the one thing that they used to love in their old one, they're going to be really unhappy. Even if every other thing you've done is better, they'll say, but how come we can't do this? And I think once you encourage them to start talking about this, then they'll, they'll be more comfortable asking for things and saying, well, actually, this is kind of inefficient. Do you think that we can change it? Um, and a really good example of this is a site we built where there was a content type that had a square thumbnail, which was a, it's called a thumbnail image, and a rectangular feature image. And just um, kind of without thinking about it, we built a content type that had two image fields. We had a thumbnail field and a feature image field. I mean, probably if you'd asked, we'd said, well, maybe they'll use different images, but I think we didn't even put that much thought into it. And I was looking around the site after it launched, and I realized that um, I think they had about 200 of these nodes. And in every single case, they used the same image in both places. So we could have saved them a ton of time by having a crop feature instead. So they upload the photo once and then crop it twice, rather than cropping it twice outside Drupal and then uploading it twice. So I mean, that was a situation where I think if we'd empowered them to to ask about it and to say, hey, how come we have to upload the image twice? Then we could have we could have made the improvement, but we didn't know that we needed to do it because we didn't ask. Um, the next thing is just kind of a simple thing, but we all know that naming things is hard, so it's really important that you make a plan. And a lot of times when you're working on a project, uh, there's an existing terminology that the team will use, and if you deviate from that, it can make things really confusing for them. Um, I did a I did a training session for a group of people, and I used the, the word teaser all over the place because it's what we called it throughout the build. And at the end of the session, they someone raised their hand and said, "What's a teaser?" And I mean, that's such a fundamental question that we overlooked, and we went the whole day talking about it, and they didn't understand the concept. So, a good way of doing this is when you're doing your IA and your designs. Label each field as it appears on the page and define it. So ask the client, do you have a name for this already? If you don't, is this name OK? And then you can distribute this to the developers when they're setting up the content types. Because if you don't, they'll each come up with their own name. And then there will be no consistency. The next tip is about help text, which is my favorite thing to do on a website. It's really important to write good help text. Um, a lot of our support requests, I noticed, were resulting from users just not understanding how it was supposed to work. Or um, they, you know, we provide extensive documentation and screencasts and we train them in how to use it. But if it comes down to it and they're in the page and they don't know what to do, it's much easier to call you or to create a support ticket than it is to actually look it up. So if you provide help in context, then they don't even have to go anywhere to find it. And I'd say they'd probably rather not have to call you. So if that help is there, they'll probably use it. Um, these are just a few things I've observed about help text. I think one of the most important things is describing where it will appear. Um, obviously, answering any, any obvious questions, like if it's an image, what size does it need to be, that kind of thing. And also listing any limitations. So if there's a, a character limit or a specific requirement for it, then it's really important to list that. Um, some bad help text, I'll show you some examples of this, but obviously, um, Bad help text would be providing no additional information. So if you have a field called icon image, and the help text is the image or icon for the widget, um, anyone can work that out. So it's actually a waste of their time to read those words. Like, you may as well have no help text there, because there's nothing in that help text that they couldn't have arrived at on their own. And this is really bad help text. This is actually just confusing. So this came from, um, we were using the title module, which allows you to um, convert node titles into field API so you can use them more flexibly. And this is just what it came with. 
So um, it's just a title. You, don't, you just don't need help text. And this was what it came with, so the developers just didn't change it. But if a client saw this, I think it would be, not only would they not know what to do, they'd probably call you and say, what does this even mean? So rather than using the title field, which is the easiest field of all to use, they would actually be confused by it. So luckily, the client didn't see it. But um, you just have to be careful for these kinds of things. And this is another example of kind of bad, just the Facebook field URL, the help text is enter the Facebook URL. And this is pretty common that you just write the help text, enter the whatever the field is called. And again, that's extremely not unhelpful. I mean, anyone knows it's a Facebook URL field. This person is employed as a content editor. They can probably work out that you're supposed to input that information. But describing what it does means that they don't have to ask you. So the better help text is adding the Facebook page URL creates a Facebook-like button for the page. So now they know what it does. Um, this is another example of average and then better. So if you have a field called broadcast network and a select list, choose the network that airs this program. I mean, that's clear enough. But um, if you say choose the network that airs this program, if your choice doesn't exist, you can add or edit the list at this link. And you can actually provide the link to the page that they need to go to. So if you have, you know, th this can be a problem if you have permissions issues. Well, not everybody can edit taxonomy. You can link to a help page that's in the actual website. But as long as you're not forcing them to take that extra step of going somewhere else to find out, whether it's calling you or whether it's looking at documentation that you've provided, um, you're saving time both for them and for you. And one of the big challenges we had with help text was we used features for config. So what ended up happening was the developers would write the help text, and then we never changed it. But um, we started doing a process where I, I think it's really hard to take a field and write help text, say, in a spreadsheet, and then send it through. I think it's important that you write the help text, you save it, you, you read it, you, you read through the page, and you make sure it all makes sense. So what we started doing is um, waiting till the content type was finished. Once it got to the dev site, I would look at it, go in, update all the help text, and then have one of the developers uh, rebuild the feature from the dev site with the updated help text. And after you've done that, you can send it through to the client and still ask for tweaks. Make sure that they know that this is something that's really easy to change. So a lot of times they won't ask you to change things because they don't know if it's easy or hard. This is one that's really easy and can pay off. And there are a couple of bonuses with help text. Um, writing it can reveal issues that you need to fix such as um, in Drupal, every time you make a content type, you get a body field. But you don't always need a body field. And most of the time, the developers leave it because it's extra work to take it off. But if you find yourself writing help text, and the help text that you write is, this field is not required, it is not visible anywhere, I mean, you can't actually seriously write that. So send it back to the developer and have them take it out. Um, and there's nothing more confusing to a content editor than seeing something like, don't worry about this field. Well, you know, well, why is it there? And the other thing is that um, you're going to have to write documentation anyway. So if you start by writing the help text, then you can copy and paste this directly and either use it as your how-to or use it as the basis for your documentation. So it's not time that's just spent on that. It's time that's kind of invested in, um, in future work. And, and again, like I said, I think this is the number one way to reduce support questions that result from just not understanding how it works. Uh, tip number five is contextual links, which is my favorite thing about Drupal. And that's because this concept of in-place administration is really different to the way a lot of content management systems work. With a lot of proprietary ones, you have you know, cms.login.com, and then you have website over here. So you log into the CMS, you make the changes, and then you have to refresh the page over here, and you know, what's happening with the case. You know, it's really hard to find things. Um, in Drupal, that just isn't a problem because you're already in the CMS. The website is the CMS. So if you need to find, if you need to change something, navigate directly to the page, click the edit link, and then you're there. And even when you save it, it refreshes the page and shows you your changes, which I think we take for granted and I took for granted as well after a while. But thinking back to the way I used to do things, it was a nightmare to have to have that, you know, just a big, huge list of 800 things that you had to search through and you had no way of um, easily finding things and editing them. So contextual links in Drupal are extremely helpful, but I found a few websites where the editors didn't have permission to see them, which is completely undermining one of the most valuable things that Drupal provides. So number one is make sure they have permission to see them, and number two is make sure they understand how to use them. Um, if someone doesn't have permission to edit a view, then they don't see the edit view 
contextual link. So you don't really have to worry about permissions, but of course it's always best to test. And um, of course there's a module for creating custom contextual links. And any time there's an extra step required to make an update or publish something, you can add a custom contextual link to save a ton of time. This is an example of just regular old contextual links. Um, if you have a view of an article, you click on the gear and you have edit and delete. So let's say you wanted to remove something from the home page. You have to click edit, scroll down, click the publishing options tab, uncheck the box and save it and then it's gone. With custom contextual links, um, out of the box you can add a few specific things. One of them is making content unsticky or sticky and one of them is removing content from the front page. So rather than having four clicks, you can go to the page, click the gear, remove content from front page, and that's done. And then from there, I mean, those are the ones you get out of the box, but you can try to think of better ones as you go. And as you start doing them, you'll think of more and more uh, useful ones. So let's say this client is really keen to promote uh, photo galleries. So add links to create photo galleries in as many places as possible and encourage people and make it easy for them to do that. You can add a link that say, uh, you know, tweet a link to this article. And like I said, I think as you use it, you'll start coming up with better and better ways. And, and sometimes even the client can suggest them, but this is something that a client would never suggest if they didn't know that they could do it. The next tip is fairly simple, which is just use common sense sometimes. And one of my least favorite examples of this is um, if you have a node that has three fields in the node edit form and those three fields output in the same order on the page, that makes perfect sense. And it's really easy to have this at the beginning because you make the fields in order probably and then they appear in order. But as you, create, as you add new fields to content types, by default they appear at the bottom. So what you end up with is these two things being completely out of alignment. And um, I think I, I've gotten some pushback on this one where a developer said, but why does it matter? And it's, it's just not intuitive. So when you're thinking about creating a page, you're thinking about those elements in the specific order. So if you come to the edit screen and they're out of order, that can be really confusing. And I know that now in like Panoply and in Drupal 8, there are a lot of complex um, updates that they've made to the user interface. And in those situations, obviously, if the save button's at the top or if the menu, uh, if the menu information is on the right, that's different. But when you're working with a simple node edit form, um, it can be just a case of as you add a new field, just move it into the place that it appears. And then, of course, turning off stuff. Um, Drupal comes with things turned on, that, and, and even control modules come with things turned on, and you don't need them. So um, keep an eye out for this. And if you have a website that never uses commenting, just disable the module. Um, you know, one of my developers said, but, but I, I have it in my head now, I always turn off commenting first. And I said, well, first of all, that's an extra step that you don't need to take. And second of all, if you're an admin with content, with comment, administration permissions, this tab appears on every single node page. So you can simplify that UI just a little bit, but you can simplify it and just uh, remove it from the page. And this is a really small example, but I think the concept is keep an eye out for things like this and um, they'll start becoming more and more obvious. Tip number seven, um, which is what I call you build it, you try it. And this is, um, the developer is testing things. So if a developer builds something, the way we do it is there's a peer review process and a, a testing process that ideally, before they create the feature, they'll write out the steps that it will take to create a piece of content or update a piece of content. And if you start writing out the steps before you've done it and it's 10 steps, you might actually think, oh, that's a lot, that's kind of complicated, what can I do to make this a little bit simpler? And then after they've done it, when they deliver it, another developer has to actually test it. So um, sometimes they'll test it and say, this workflow is crazy, change it, make it better. Um, that's not necessarily the point. I mean, I don't, I don't really see the developers as a gateway for that kind of thing, but the idea is that the more they actually use the CMS, the more likely they are to notice things that are um, complicated or, or that don't make sense. And, and then they, they get better. So if they, if they notice it's something that someone else did that was a little bit clunky, doesn't necessarily mean they had to send it back for change, but next time they build that, they'll have more of an understanding of the way it's being used and, and the way they can do it better. So this is um, the seven 
tips all in a row. And I mean, I, I think this, looking at it, it's a, it's a pretty simple list of things to do. Um, there's nothing particularly time consuming or scary or expensive here. And um, the point that I made earlier is that when you start with a really good foundation, then you can start looking at things like um, context admin, which is where you can create complicated pages to do things in bulk and contextual workflows, those kinds of things. But that's not what the takeaway is from here. The, the takeaway, I think, is that by just starting out with some really simple best practices and strategies and things to look out for, that you can uh, build a better product. And um, this is not something that I said, but Jeff Eaton said in a presentation that he gave, content editors are the most important users of your website. I don't think this needs to be um, <laughs> controversial. It's not, it's not a debate. But um, you don't really need to agree. But the idea that a website is only as good as the people who create the content, um, if you make a system that content editors like and that they find intuitive, they'll create better content, they'll create more content, and they'll do it faster. If you don't, they won't. And I think if you don't take away this, that content editors are the most important users, I think if you at least take away that content editors are actual users of your website, so when you're building the website and when you're doing the UX, um, we always focus on the front, we focus on the design, we focus on the, the pixels, but the content editors are the most critical piece in making the website successful. So just paying those little bits of attention here and there really goes a long way. And that's all. Questions? Hey, that was a great talk. Um, with um, WYSIWYGS, which could be a discussion in itself, but um, a fellow Australian actually said we should stop calling them that and call them visual editors because they give too much connotation of power to a content editor. Um, and they, and they, they create a bug. Well, what I see is not what I get. The question was, what was your thoughts on that? I guess that was the answer. But uh, <laughs> well, I think it's just, it's just a necessary evil. I mean, obviously, I would rather not have to deal with it. But I think it's about um, explaining what they are and how they should be used. And I think a lot of times at the start of the project, the client will demand that everything look perfect and it strip their Microsoft Word tags perfectly and um, you know, do their line breaks perfectly. But I think it's all about educating them and saying, we can spend two days trying to ensure that every time you pay something from Microsoft Word, it's going to be absolutely perfect. But it's probably better for you to spend um, you know, the few seconds it takes to use that little erase icon <laughs> instead. And it's probably um, a much better result. I mean, I think a lot of it is <clears throat> educating and, and explaining. And um, yeah, I don't enjoy WYSIWYGS myself. but. <laughs> No other questions? Oh. What's your thought about content strategy and making tools for the editors to support a content strategy? I mean, we build uh, websites that's responsive, so you have to write content both to small screens and, and larger screens. So what's your thought on that? I think it's fantastic, um, but most of our clients aren't interested in spending money on it. So I think if everyone wanted to invest the time, then every product would be um, a lot better. But what we found, especially with government and with big, with big kind of um, government higher education, I think maybe media companies are much more interested in <coughs> investing that time. And I mean, even having a content strategy would, would go a long way on this process, especially, like you said, with responsive sites. But um, this is kind of why I pitched this talk, is that I know that it's not practical for all of us to spend three months researching and doing um, user testing and asking people how they find the tools to use. This is, this is the tool that we're building with, so it's about maximizing the, the value from it for the, the least amount of effort. I have a question uh, in regard to um, training. So do you, what kind of material do you provide to your clients? 
<laughs> does <laughs> does your approach uh, replace the training never, document? Never, never. But oh. I think it depends on the team. We I did training for a team of I think a hundred editors and I put together like a 25 page manual that they could follow along and then use after the fact. But most of the time, um, if the system is intuitive and you provide a fairly detailed, just kind of step by step, sometimes we do screencasts, but the problem with screencasts is that they're really hard to update. So if you make a small change, then the screencast is no longer useful. So we have wiki pages in our project tracker and then I actually have started creating um, we'll set up a content type in Drupal that's only visible to logged in users and then actually create the how-to guides in Drupal and link to them from the main menu. So that way, um, at least it's in the right place. So you can, like I said with the help text, if you have a how-to page on how to build this content type, you can link to it directly from the content type and that way it's, it's in the website. They don't have to log into something else. They don't have to find another link. It's right there. Um, but yeah, training is, um, it's something that we build into the budget. So if we know that it's a team of 100, then we'll budget so much time for putting together the material and then actually training them. But I think um, nothing, will, nothing replaces in-person yeah. help. Thanks. <laughs> How much do you work with your clients to work out the editorial workflow, which is very, very personal from uh, client to client, but to what extent do you handle it? It depends on the client there because sometimes, as I said, um, we have clients that say, you can't, we don't want you to talk to them. You know, we don't care what their workflow is. We're going to set up a workflow that they're going to use because we know, we know how it should work and they'll just have to do it. And obviously the problem with that is, and this is what I used to always do, is then you get um, those highly technical users that are just constantly trying to find a way around the processes that you put in place. So where possible, I think it's really important, but one of the things I've found is that when you ask even media and like pretty savvy web teams, what's your editorial workflow, they kind of go, what do you mean, you know, we put the content in, that's, that's how it works. So um, obviously establishing, you know, do you do your reviews offline, do you do your reviews online, is there something we can do online to make that process easier? That really helps, but most of the time they, they don't know what we mean until we build it. So you build them something simple, and this is the approach we take a lot, is we deliver them what we think they need at a minimum and then add to it as we go. Because I think a lot of times um, if you get that kind of top down, this is what it is, you'll get a workflow with 10 approval steps and then within two weeks every single one of them has been removed because it just wasn't practical. So, I mean, that's not really an answer, but if, if the client's willing to, then it's, it's highly beneficial to do that at the start. And the, the great thing about Drupal is um, what we've also started doing is spinning up a kind of a, just a base install with the things I mentioned and sending it to them at the very beginning and saying, play around with this. You know, you want a forum on your website, play around with the Drupal forum, let us know. If this, meet, if this meets your expectations, is there anything extra that you want to do? And even something as simple as creating a node and saving it, um, sometimes people are really impressed by <laughs> how easy it is to do that in Drupal. And when you save it, it takes you right to the page. And, um, and then you can start that conversation. OK, it works, but what are some things that might make it better? We just had a, a, a Drupal shop builder say um, a large multi-site platform. and we had editorial workflows in the RFP and they intentionally removed that from the RFP and said, we don't want to touch that. It's a bit of a third rail. Oh. Um, and they said- They can well, do that? What they, well, what they said was every we site that, that comes on is going to have their own uh, editorial workflow oh. and we don't want to be caught, caught up trying to figure out all the different patterns and combinations involved and so they <coughs> left it out and I was wondering whether there was an alternative way to approach that problem. When you say multi-site, what, what's the actual setup? So uh, it's one database serving? Multiple databases. It's, oh. it's, it's one uh, doc route um, oh. and uh, one set of shared tools and then multiple sites adding customizations as needed. And they each need a different workflow? Yeah, different offices in different countries working different ways. Hmm. Well, I mean, we, we've set up some pretty complicated ones using Workbench, which allows you to set up sections and... It's not perfect, but it does allow you to segment it a little bit. I mean, I would definitely say it's not something that 
we wouldn't touch because it's the third rail. It's never particularly fun, but if you budget for the time and the testing and the, the feedback that you need, I think um, I think with something like that, it'd probably be best to say, let's spend a week workshopping it and then see what we can do. But um, oftentimes, when you ask the client what their workflow should be, they really don't know, and they'll ask us, what do you recommend? So did you have it mapped out beforehand? Um, no. I think every office had their own expectations, and they all kind of thought that the workflow would be similar to the one they're already using for their current website. Um, and I think that was probably uh, why the, the developers sort of <laughs> removed it. Um, but now, we, I mean, what they ended up delivering was, an, uh, was the default, the admin user the ed and, and the, uh, the content editor um, uh, user types. And, uh, and so now we're trying to uh, sort of fold in Workbench after the fact. And it's... Uh, Workbench is really good for that kind of stuff. And, and even um, there's something called content, there's a module called context admin. And even views bulk operations you can use to set up Pretty simple but useful. So if, if five offices each want five different filtered or landing pages or whatever, it's really not hard to set those up. Okay, Just got to know what to ask for. I, I, I will be asking for it next. Thank you. <laughs> OK, no more questions? Feedback, of course, um, if you go to prog 2013 drupalorg slash node slash 99, you can rate my session. So thanks. <laughs>